I'm going to be talking about Galatians chapter 3 and I'm going to break bread. And the situation there in Galatians chapter 3 is that the Galatians have believed, but now they're falling away. And Paul is by all means saying, Don't fall away. Now, you and I have believed. Um, there's only one of two possible exits from the Day of Judgment. We shall come to the Day of Judgment, right? Every single one of us. And it's either to eternal life or to eternal death. There's a binary outcome. There's no middle path. And so either we're going to abide in Christ, where we are now, or we're going to fall away. Right? So this is a begging of us not to fall away, as he's begging the Galatians. Don't drift away from this. This is fantastic. And it would be the greatest tragedy to have believed in the Lord Jesus and fall away from all that potential, eternity, forgiveness, relationship with God and Jesus forever. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you to focus upon Jesus and upon his death and all that it should mean for us and the wonderful gifts that are available to us in him of salvation, of eternity, of forgiveness, of reconciliation with you, of your spirit in our hearts. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will open our eyes to the wonder of the things that we stand related to, because of the Lord's body and blood, his death for us. We pray that you will strengthen all of us in his body in these last days, that we might not fall away, and we pray for special strength for those who are very intensely tested at this time by persecution, by hatred of others towards them, by misunderstanding, by rejection. Those who are depressed, those who are seriously ill, those who are in financial crisis, those who are in domestic crisis with their marriages, with their relationships, with their children, with their parents. We pray, Father, that you will bless and strengthen each and every one of us, that the wonder of what we stand related to may not be lost because of the pressure of this world, but that we might look with the eyes of faith to that which is invisible. For Jesus' sake, for the sake of all that he achieved for us, please hear us. Amen. So, O oh foolish Galatians, he says, it was verse 1, before your own eyes that Jesus Christ was openly displayed or placarded, written up there as crucified. And he's talking about how he personally had converted these people in Galatia. And he's saying, you saw Christ crucified. And he means, you saw him crucified in me. Now, that is the essential witness People don't read the Bibles, and especially in an illiterate society, they didn't obviously read, they didn't have access to the scriptures. But he says, you had Jesus Christ written, crucified, placarded, written there, crucified in front of you. With your own eyes, you saw this, and he is talking about their personal meeting with him. Elsewhere, he's going to say, when I was with you, you'd have pulled out your own eyes and given them to me. So then, in our witness, we are Jesus. We are the body of Christ. He has no other face, hands, legs, fingers than you and me. Because that is what people see of Jesus when they meet us. We are him to the eyes of this world. That's why he can tell the Corinthians 2, Corinthians 2, 10, I appeal to you in the face of Jesus Christ, as if I am his face to you. And... He, he said in uh, chapter 1 that Jesus revealed himself in me so that I might testify him to the world. That is, our witness to the world and to others is from the Spirit of Christ that is within me. So insofar as we fellowship his sufferings, we are the witness of him. you rejected by your family, hated misunderstood, misjudged in the court of public opinion, so was Jesus. And insofar as you fellowship that suffering, you witness him to the world. Do you have chronic health issues? So did he on the cross. And you therefore 
are witnessing him to the world. Do you show love in the face of rejection? That's the spirit of the crucified Jesus. And so then, he goes on to say that, look, the biggest reason why you should not fall away is because you received the Spirit. Verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now perfected in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if it be indeed in vain? When he says suffer, I think he's using the word in the sense of experience. There's no record in Acts, anyway, that the Galatian churches suffered as in persecution. I mean, they probably did. But I think that he's using suffer here in the sense of experience. Like when he's on the beach in Malta and the, the snake gets onto him and people think he's going to die. It says they looked at him a long time and he suffered no harm. So suffered in that sense means to experience. So he's saying to them, have you experienced so much? That is of the ministry of the Spirit in vain. And this from here on in Galatians is going to be his whole argument. That the biggest evidence that you have believed the right thing in believing in Jesus is the ministry of the Spirit to you. And the fact that you've received the Holy Spirit, this is the biggest evidence. If you go to the law and to legalism and Judaism, you're not going to get the Spirit out of that. And there's no evidence of it. And he's going to develop this right from now on, right up to the end of, the, uh, end of Galatians. Keeps on talking about the Spirit. And it is in that context that he talks about the promises to Abraham and so on. Now, he's saying here, then, that did you uh, suffer so much in vain? Verse 5, does he that supplies to you the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Jesus supplies the Spirit, he says, to you and works miracles. The Holy Spirit worked in two senses. There was the internal gift of the Holy Spirit, which is for all time. It was promised in Acts 2, repent, be baptized every one of you, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, because the promise is to you and to your children, and all that are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. That remains for all time. That is the gift of his mind, his disposition, his presence, the comforter within our hearts. That is for all time. But in the first century, that was manifest by miraculous gifts. Speaking in tongues or languages, miracles, so on. Those miraculous manifestations are now no more. But the essential gift of the Spirit remains. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Paul says. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, Romans 5, 5, by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. So the arena of the Spirit's operation is within the human heart. What Jesus is saying in the, in the Comforter passages, John 14 to 16, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you without your rabbi, as it were, teaching you. I shall still be with you, even though you will not physically see me. But the gift of the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, will be to make me real to you. You will feel my presence. You will be taught by me. I will be active in your life. So, he's going to go on now to talk about the promises to Abraham. And we may think, oh yeah, promises to Abraham. They were that Abraham and his seed would inherit the earth forever. And we know from Hebrews 11 and from Acts 7 that Abraham died and didn't receive the promises. So it was. But there is a wider dimension, a broader dimension to these promises to Abraham. Because if you promised eternal life, and sure, Abraham and the seed will all receive it by being resurrected from the dead and given eternity when Jesus returns. But to get to that point, you need to be forgiven of your sins. You need to be cleansed. And that also is a dimension of the promises to Abraham. And it is that which I think he has in view here when he keeps talking about the 
the promise of the Spirit. You see, he, he's going to say in uh, <clears throat> verse 14, so that the Gentiles might, so that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, the promises to Abraham did have incipient, small-scale fulfillment. It's not only that they're going to come true when Jesus comes back. For example, from one man and him as good as dead, as Paul says, from Abraham came this huge nation. Yes, the seed became many as the stars in the sky. This point is made a number of times in the Old Testament that the promises to Abraham did have a small fulfillment. For example, 70 of them went down into Egypt at the time of Jacob and Joseph, and they came out, millions of them, in the space of 430 years. And the point is made there, really, that this was a fulfilment of the promises to Abraham. So those promises did have some other fulfilments apart from, in the last day when Jesus comes, Abraham and the seed are resurrected and inherit the land forever. It's more than just that. And in Acts 3, Peter talks about the blessing that was promised to Abraham. And he says that he has, Jesus has now come to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So the blessing promised to Abraham, as Peter interprets it, is not just forgiveness. It is the blessing of being turned away from sin which is what we all need, to be converted, to be taken away from sin, to be turned away from sin, to have a new psychology, a new pair of eyes, a new way of looking at life. And this then is the context in which he, he is talking here. He doesn't just start talking about the promises to Abraham just like that. It's all in this whole context from chapter 3 to the end of chapter 6 about the Spirit and your receipt of the Spirit is the biggest evidence that Christianity is for real. And of course that point is made elsewhere. Apostle, the Apostle John says, Hereby we know that he abides in us by his Spirit which he has given us. This is the concrete evidence that we have in our possession. The gift of the Spirit is called in 2 Corinthians 1 the guarantee that he has given you the Spirit in your hearts. It's in the heart. We're talking about miraculous gifts. And that, he says, is the guarantee. That is the ceiling by which we know that this is all valid and relevant. So, he's going to go on here to say, look, the promises, verse 16, were made to Abraham and his seed. And Paul interprets that as a singular. The promises that you shall have eternity, eternal inheritance, were to Abraham and his seed, two people. Jesus. But that one seed was to be many, as the stars in the sky, for multitude. And that's why you, you, you see that apparent uh, error in grammar, even in Genesis, in the actual promises where told, Abraham was told, you will have a seed, and I will be their God. So the singular seed, Paul interprets as Jesus, becomes many. And how does that happen? Because, as he says at the end of the chapter, as many of us as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ, and therefore we are the seed. All that is true of Jesus becomes true of us. If he was the seed of Abraham, so are we. The promises then apply to us. The, this one singular seed becomes as many as the stars in the sky, the grains of sand on the seashore. So that's the idea. And... He says in verse 26 that we also become the sons of God. You are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, because as many of you as are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So then, we are all the children of God. We are all the sons of God, actually. Not the children of God, but the sons of God. Jesus was the Son of God, so are you, if you're in Christ. And in chapter 4, he goes on to make this amazing point, carrying on this theme that if you are in Christ, then you are also the beloved Son of God. You have also received the Holy Spirit, as Jesus did. Because he says that we were adopted. 
And that's a wonderful idea because under Bowman and Jewish law at the time, if you were adopted as a son, your father could never ever disown you. You could walk away from him. But he could never disown you. A father could disown his own natural son, but he could never disown his own adopted son. You understand why? So he didn't adopt a child, get fed up with him and disown him. He couldn't do that. We are the adopted sons. The only way we're not going to be saved is if you disown God. But then chapter 4 verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son, Jesus, into our hearts. The Spirit works in the heart. He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. Well, who called God Abba, Daddy? It was Jesus, Abba, Father. And we become more than adopted sons, but the, as it were, the actual sons, the actual Son of God, with the same relationship to the Father as Jesus had. And that is the point of John 17, again in the context of the gift of the Spirit, that the unity, the connection between the Father and the Son is to be experienced by us. And then chapter 5, he goes on, allow the Spirit to bring forth its fruit. He talks about the Spirit an awful lot in chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit. Sow to the Spirit in chapter 6, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life, etc. So his big argument all the way through here is don't go back to the law, the Judaism won't give you the Holy Spirit. You've got it. And don't give it up. Because this is the seal, but you can give it up, because he's not actually going to force you to be or do anything that you don't totally want to do. So then, <clears throat> he, verse 5, supplies to you the Spirit, even though they were wobbly in their faith, the Lord Jesus was still in connection with them, trying to bring them back. It's the same word in Colossians 2.19 of how the Lord Jesus is the head of the body and he supplies nourishment to every part of the body. What is that nourishment he supplies? It is the spirit. If you stay in the body. And you know, this idea of being supplied with the spirit. As he says here in verse 5, you, you meet it quite often. Philippians, a couple of times there, he talks about the supply of of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My God shall supply all your need according to all his riches. In 1 Corinthians 1, he says that you have been enriched by the gifts of the Spirit. So then, he supplies us with his Spirit. Now I'm labelling this point for one thing because this has been true to the text of the New Testament. And for another thing, because I know a lot of folks got this big hang-up about, oh, Holy Spirit, oh no, we don't have the gifts of the Spirit today, we don't speak in tongues, it's all not relevant to me. But it's more than relevant. This is what it is to be a Christian. Forget this speaking in tongues, miracles, all, all this stuff. That's not what it's talking about. That was the physical, literal manifestation of it in the first century. Sure, we don't have that. But... Put that on one side. So much of all this emphasis on the work of the Spirit and the supply of the Spirit, etc., is relevant to us today because this is how He works in our hearts. This is the point. So, verse 14. That upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he's saying that we receive the promised Spirit through faith in Christ, and that that is part of the blessing of Abraham, just how Peter interpreted it in Acts 3, that the blessing, you'll be blessed in being turned away from your sins. This is psychological, internal, in the heart, in the mind, strengthening. So, you receive, he says, the Holy Spirit that was promised. Or where was the Holy Spirit promised? John 14 to 16. Jesus promised us the Comforter. It's very clear all the way through there. But this is a, a, an all-time promise to all in him. That I will be present with you. I am going to heaven. Sure, I shall die and go to heaven. But 
don't panic. I shall be with you. I shall abide with you. He says, I say this to you, John 15, abiding with you now. Like I'm physically with you, my presence, but I will abide with you forever through the Comforter, which shall be within you. This is, as I say, not talking about miracles and all that. It's talking about his abiding presence in your heart, in your life. That is what you can have. That is what actually you must have to be a Christian. Without that, you are none of his, Paul says. It's that important. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given unto us. Strengthened with might, Ephesians 3, by his Spirit in the inner man. His Spirit strengthens you internally in the inner man. And this is what we need. This is man's greatest need. Because we're so weak. We face temptation and we give in. We need to be turned from all that. And these promises of the Spirit meet man at his greatest need. Our need is met absolutely there by this gift of the Spirit. But you can turn away from it. The Corinthians did the same. They were filled with the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, enriched in all things. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. But I can't speak to you as spiritual people. You're not spiritual. You're carnal. You're fleshly. The same here. You've got the Spirit, you people in Galatia, but you're turning away from it. The wonder of it seems to be too much. And yet, you'd rather go back to mere religion, doing a few rituals and salvation. Well, yeah, I hope so. I don't know, but I hope so. Um, yeah, you know, I'm busy. Uh, I can only spend a couple of hours a week maximum on my religious stuff, on my church life. So, yeah, I will get into this mentality of, yes, attendance now and again at a synagogue, church, whatever. And, yes, I will do my rituals. And as to salvation, forgiveness, well, I hope so. I think too much about that, ultimate, those ultimate issues. Well, those ultimate issues are the ultimate issues, and they are dealt with. If you are in Christ and have received the Spirit, you are cleansed, you are forgiven, you definitely have the certain hope, the elpis, the absolute certainty of salvation, so that you can say with me, if I die now, or if Jesus comes now, by his great grace, I will be saved. I have eternity secured. You might be, I might be like the Galatians and chuck it all away tomorrow. But at this point, we can say that. This then is the good news. Well, I've said that the, when he says in verse 14, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the promised Spirit through faith. The promise was made there in John 14 to 16, but not only there, you've got it in Acts 2. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off. Talking about two generations, this is talking about a promise to the Jews, to the Gentiles, absolutely, for all time. And again, next two, being exalted by the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus has received that promise and has given it to us. And again, Ephesians 1.13, In whom, Jesus, you also believed, having heard the word of the truth, and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You, you, you cannot get away from it that the... The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, is what was promised. And that is what seals you. That is your guarantee. You can throw your guarantee away, which is what Galatians were doing. But 2 Corinthians 1 is clear. Now he that establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, that is with the Spirit, is God, who also sealed us and gave us the guarantee of the Spirit in our lives hearts. He has sealed us, anointed us, sealed us, and given us the guarantee of the Spirit in our hearts. And that sealing, putting that together with Ephesians 1, you have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. A fairly watertight case in terms of putting these scriptures together. And it cannot be argued against. All the arguments against it are, are, are very, very flimsy in 
in terms of exposition, in terms of trying to twist the Greek to mean this, that, or the other, to try to get away from it. Because this assurance is so amazing. And why do people try to wiggle and wheedle their way out of it, just like the Galatians? Why do they chuck it all away? Because if this is true, and it is true, this takes my whole life, my whole heart, strength, soul and mind is devoted to responding to this. I'm going to live forever. I, who am a terribly weak person, who am a terrible sinner, have been, still am, will be, unfortunately. By his grace that is dealt with. Whoa. My sin, your sin, is no longer the barrier between him and me. And he is going to give you the blessing promised to Abraham, which Peter says, is to turn you away from your iniquities. He does the conversion. People are all very all nervous about this. Oh, are you saying that you can't believe unless you have the Spirit of God? Well, you can't believe unless you have the Spirit of God working upon you. That's, I think, pretty clear. Lydia, for example, the Lord opened her heart so that she attended unto what was spoken by Paul. It's fairly clear that he took the first move. God was not hiding behind a rock and we found him by our Bible study or whatever. Not at all. Love takes the initiative. This is the movement of the Spirit. And it is for us to respond. We are not forced. Because man is not a, a puppet that is just played with and some get played with and some don't. No, of course not. God thirsts for relationship. But the problem with having a relationship with you and me is that we're so weak. We're all over the place. But therefore, if you say yes, he will work in your mind. He will restructure your psychology, if you like, if you want to put it in those terms. Give you, as John's Gospel seems to say, a new pair of eyes. Look at life differently. The Spirit, the blessing promised to Abraham will turn you away from your iniquities. And you see, we need all this so that we can receive the fullness of the promise to Abraham, which is eternal inheritance of the earth. You're not going to get to eternal life without being forgiven in this life, without being transformed in this life, without having, you know, I will be their God, having this personal relationship with Jesus. This is what is on offer. So then, <clears throat> it's in this context that he is saying, that's 16 for example, that we are the seed. The seed was singular, but it becomes plural if we are in Christ. This is how the Christian gospel was preached to Abraham. Absolutely. And he, he digresses a bit uh, for a few verses, starting from verse 17, for a few verses about, don't go back to the law, the law can't give you any of this. And he, i uh, just like to look at one bit of that, verse 17, he says, this is what I mean. The law, which came years after the promises to Abraham, <clears throat> does not annul a covenant that was previously ratified by God so as to make the promise of no effect. He says the law of Moses was just temporary. And it, it came after the promises to Abraham. So the promises to Abraham of eternal life and all that goes with that, forgiveness and sanctification to get to the eternal life, that is implicit in them, the promise to Abraham is, as he says in verse 14, the promise of the Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit. All that was there well before the law of Moses. And he is saying that, verse 17, the covenant with Abraham had been ratified. It had been confirmed by God. Well, in Hebrews 6, Paul, I think it was Paul, makes a, a big case on this. He says, look, God's word of promise to Abraham should be good enough for you, right? God said, you and your seed will live forever and will eternally inherit the land and so on. Isn't that good enough? Well, Hebrews 6 says, and he confirmed it by an oath, so that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. What two things? The word of the promise and the confirmation of it by an oath. 
And actually, it's even more wonderful than that, because in Romans, Paul says that the death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, confirmed the promises made to Abraham. So, God made the promise. Look, if you're in the seed, you're going to live forever. Oh, I'll confirm that by an oath. Or I swear by my own self, because I can swear by nobody or anything greater. Okay, then Jesus later died, and his blood was again the confirmation. And this is why we take the cup of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, in his blood. The death of Jesus, of course, achieved various things. It was all multiple, multi-factorial. One of the things it did was to confirm the covenant to Abraham. This simple promise, simple as, you and your seed will live forever. Now, as again he says in Hebrews, even to men, in their human dealings with each other in secular life, an oath is the end of all strife. You said this and you made an oath. God himself spoke, and his word is surely enough. You and your seed will live forever. Okay, but it's confirmed by an oath, and it is confirmed again by the death of his son, by the blood of his son. And that should be an end, he says, because he was of all strife, of all questioning, will I be saved? Is it really true? What more do you want? And he says, he did this, Hebrews says, because he was willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability, the unchangeability of his word, that we might have a strong consolation. Putting it another way, Paul says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, as if God's love needs any commendation. Okay, he did commend it. It's as if the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus was to confirm, by all means, look, get it, the simple promise that if you're in the seed of Abraham, you will be saved. Well, what more could God do to say, look, take me at my word? And if I ask you, if Jesus comes now, or you die now, you're going to be saved? You're going to live forever? The promises to Abraham, they're going to come true for you? <laughs> yes. And if you say, well, I don't know, well, you know, you don't know what a bad guy I am, Duncan. You, you, you see, I've got a lot of sin, you see. I've got a lot of stuff you don't know about. People tell me that. I don't doubt it, but the point is that this is the whole point, that if you are in Christ, then you are the seed, you are in him you are more than an adopted son. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Why do you doubt it? Probing deeper into death psychology. Why do you doubt it? I don't think it's simply because you're worried about your secret sins or actually this, that, the others going on in my life. I suggest that this subconscious, unspoken reason is because if this is true, and it is true, it's confirmed by the blood of Jesus, and it was anyway a promise of God's word, confirmed by an oath that he swore. Why do you doubt it? Because if this is true, and it is true, this demands everything from you. This is no more a hobby. They wanted to go back to hobby level religion. Join a synagogue, get into Judaism, Yes, do a few rituals, come along to a few meetings, go through the ritual, go through the drill. That's the same mentality in a lot of people who are, in between the, the quotes, Christian. Go to church now and again. It might even be quite enthusiastic, might even go twice a week. Uh, but I've got my life, generally, and yes, I've got uh, church life as part of it. My work life and all the rest of it, my family life and all that, yeah, church life. And yes, yes, we break bread, or do your ritual, whatever ritual you want to do. And doing rituals does make you feel better. That's the whole psychology of it. That's why religion, per se, is so massively popular and always has been amongst human beings. But the truth of Jesus Christ is different. You are forgiven. You will live forever. Those deep psychological fears that you have deep inside you about your sins, some of which are so deep 
that you cannot consciously verbalize them even to yourself, but you sense they are there. All that is scribbled. That is no longer a barrier. Because he has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, so that you as a sinner like me, like Paul, can cry to God, Daddy. And a daddy loves his little boy. A daddy loves his little girl. That's how it is. And he loves us and wants to save us. So then, what shall we say to these things? As I so often say, you come to these wonderful, wonderful things. You know, verse 22, he, he comes back from his discourse about how the law is definitely not going to save you. He says, the, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And I'm saying that the promise, yes, is the promise to Abraham, but it is not simply that you will inherit the earth and live forever when Jesus comes. It is that. But it is the promise of verse 14, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, through faith. And this is, as I say, it goes all the way through Galatians from now on. Chapter 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So don't fall away from the wonder of all this. That is what He's saying. And as I say, He at the end here in, in, in Galatians 3, he says that by having been baptized into Christ, all that is true of him becomes true of you. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And he also said, and you are the light of the world. All that's true of him becomes true of us. He was the seed of Abraham. He was the son of God. So are we. In chapter 3, he's saying Jesus was the singular seed of Abraham. But if you're in him, and this is why to be a brother or sister in Christ, brethren in Christ, is how we should understand ourselves. Absolutely then we also are the seed. We also are the son. And then in chapter 4, he's going to develop what it means to also be the son of God. As he says in here in chapter 3, 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Because as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. Singular. Jesus. He was the singular seed. And the heirs, plural, according to the promise. So then, don't fall away. Don't go back to mere religion. Because that will not save you. But it is a very strong tendency. And you can see it here in Galatians, as I said when we were chatting about chapter 1. Why was it that Gentiles who had been baptized as Christians would even be attracted to Judaism? might seem odd. Why would they wish to leave Christianity and go to Judaism? Yeah, I can understand it, because there you are, you've come to believe in the one God of Abraham, come to believe in some sort of Messiah, but the, the life-changing, mind-changing, personality-changing influence of Jesus can be too much for people who have got too strongly their own agenda. Don't fiddle with me. I want to be the same guy that I always was. I still want to go down the idol temple, down a pub or whatever it might be, get drunk with the guys and oh, we'll carry on how I am. And yes, 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 I will do my religious bit. This is very attractive. This is why all through the New Testament you see this attraction to return to, or to, not to return, but to go to the law of Moses. In Crete, for example, he's up against the same problem. He's writing to Titus. And he says, These, you people in Crete are drinking too much wine, you live in a pretty laid-back lifestyle, but you're going to the synagogue now. What are you doing that for? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Why they should do that? Because the claim of Jesus upon you, the total takeover of your mind, of your life, of your heart, of your soul, of your attitude to money, of your attitude to wealth, of your attitude to your own life, this is huge. People don't like that. Don't fiddle with me too deeply. That's what they're saying. But I've got a religious conscience, and how can I solve that? Well, Judaism was, was a good way to go, and it's the same with churchianity. How can I solve my religious conscience? Yeah, go to church, now and again, even once a week, even twice a week, if you're that keen. And uh, yes, you come out of 
that place feeling, as it's often said, it was good to be here. You have a religious experience. That then comes to nothing as you face your own grave blanks, as you face your own mortality. What have you got? The burden of your own sin, of your own unreformed character, of your own unreformed personality. And it is that which is met in Jesus. If with your whole heart you open yourself up, like David in the Psalms, with my whole heart, and he wasn't perfect, right? he was a fairly big time sinner, but all the same, with my whole heart I seek you. That's the whole thing. If you open up your heart, he will come in. I stand and knock at the door, the Lord says, Revelation 3, and if any man hear my voice, as we have done, and open the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And that's where we're at, isn't it, with this bread and wine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and this wine, in which we see the symbol of his body and his blood. Abide with us. Come into our lives. Come into our hearts. Take us over. So that our body might be part of his body so that we might receive nourishment from him who is the head, and that we might abide with you and with him forever. For his sake. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this cup of the new covenant that speaks of how you have confirmed the certainty of your promise, your word to Abraham, that he and his seed shall live forever. We believe you, Father. We do believe you. That this shall be true for little me. By absolute grace, and by the grace of your spirit sanctifying and changing me. But please, Father, may we be more open to that influence, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the transformation now and the life eternal at the Lord's return. 